everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Maggie, and I would like to welcome you to today's session, Content Marketing That Connects With Your Customers, brought to you by Staples Connect and Wiserv. We are excited to offer this event today as part of our Small Business Celebration Week. We have brought in a marketing expert to cover today's topic. Emily Aborn, Aborn is the founder and owner of She Built This. She has over a decade of experience working with executives and entrepreneurs in marketing. Her passion is helping others discover how to share their stories through compelling content, creative social media, and copy throughout their branding. At the end of the session today, we will have time for Q&A. Please scan the QR code on the screen or follow the link on the Eventbrite page to submit your questions at any time during the presentation. It is my pleasure to introduce you to Emily Aborn. Emily, thank you for being here today. Thank you, and thank you so much for having me. Happy Wednesday to everyone. I hope you're having a great Cinco de Mayo so far, and you're, you're almost over the hump of the week. <laughs> Um, so to start off today, I want you to imagine that you're sitting in your office at work. Maybe for some of you, you don't need to imagine this because that's where you are right now. Um, so what if I told you that I wanted you to describe how to get where you are, but I don't want you to tell me your exact location? Would you start out by saying, well, I see a lamp, I see a computer, I see a desk, I see four blue-gray walls, probably not. Um, in fact, first you would probably want to start by asking where I was and so that you could guide me to where you are. Am I starting, for example, in Florida or am I just up the road? Do I need to navigate the city of New York City to get to you? So that's kind of what I want to touch on or talk about today is how your message is going to be drastically different depending on where your customers are. And with our marketing and messaging, it's the same thing. A lot of times we like to start talking about ourselves. We like to talk about our products and our services and the beautiful walls that we've built to sell these things from. But if you walk away with nothing else today, I want you to walk away with the fact that better content, better messaging all comes down to focusing on your customers first and where and who your clients are and meeting them there. Once we know that, then we can guide them to where we are and to what we have to offer. So today we're going to talk about that. Um, as Maggie said, my name is Emily Aborn. I'm a content writer and the owner of She Built This, which is a community for uh, women entrepreneurs. And right now my business is mostly conducted online, but I do have experience with owning a brick and mortar business. And I also have a lot of experience planning in-person events. So I kind of have my feet in all sorts of different industries. Um, I've been doing marketing and copywriting for 12 years now for businesses of all sizes in a variety of different industries. And I see that we have a variety of different industries today too. A lot of you submitted in what, what industry you're in. So we have like home care, retail, publishing, art, beauty, and restaurants. And what I'm gonna share is applicable to you no matter what your industry is. So with that, let's dive right in. First of all, I wanna start off by giving you a little bit of confidence about what it is that you offer. Your clients and customers are looking for what you have. Chances are, if you're in this room, you've done a little bit of market research and you already know that what you're offering is valuable and that it's a sought after commodity. So the key is really getting people to seek your offering over everybody else's. I love thinking of the fact that, you know, your customers want what you have because it really does help to give you confidence when you're putting it out there. It actually does people a disservice when we hold ourselves back from putting our message out there because it's like we have a solution to their problem and by not sharing it with them, we're not giving them the solution to that problem. So your customers, your job is to lead them on a journey to get them to find you and by doing that, you really want to stand out apart from all the other noise and the rest of the crowd that they're bombarded with. So let's start with who these clients and customers are. 
Um, this is this is often called an avatar. So what we're going to be doing is putting together an ideal client. And this is something that you're probably going to want to work on. If you haven't already worked on it, you're going to want to work on it outside of this workshop too. An avatar is simply a fictional character who represents the, your ideal prospect or prospects. So when you get really clear on what this person looks like, it helps you to understand what their underlying beliefs are, what fears and desires they have that are going to influence their buying decisions. And that is also the language that you're going to want to use when you're trying to lead them to work with you. So an avatar is one part demographics and one part psychographics. And I'm quickly going to go over the difference. So demographics are really tangible things like age, race, ethnicity, gender, marital status, income, education, and employment. Psychographics are some of those underlying things that drive our buying decisions like attitudes, interests, personality traits, stressors, um, and, and lifestyle patterns of your target market. So both of these things together make up the people that are, and when I say target market, it's the people that are most likely to buy from you. Um, I had a brick and mortar store, like I told you, and I was always surprised with the different types of people that would come in that were outside of my target market, but this is kind of the standard for your business. So we need to factor in both of these when we're marketing to these people, because we, again, want to speak to their language. So I'm going to give you a really tangible, um, example. And this is going to be a little generic or what seems stereotypical. So you're going to have to just forgive me. So let's say if you own a fishing and tackle store, maybe your demographic is a older man living in New England. He's like, he's married, he has two kids and he makes enough money to be able to go off and enjoy a hobby like fishing. So maybe him and his wife, you know, they each make around 75 to a hundred thousand dollars a year. They're employed full time. They're both college graduates and they hold a master's degree. So that's an example of describing someone's demographic. Um, their psychographic, however, might be a little bit different. And this is actually kind of the fun part. So you want to talk about what else interests this kind of customer. Does he also like watching football on TV or is he going to be more of that woodsman who can be found out in his backyard holding an ax? What values does he have? What uh, maybe he values a lot of family time and making memories and he likes quality over quantity. And lastly, you want to take a look at what other factors, like what other pieces make up his lifestyle. So if I were trying to sell this guy a fishing rod at my um, fishing and tackle store, I probably wouldn't start by telling him that this particular fishing rod is going to get him more attention at the gym. I would probably start by telling him that the fishing rod is going to last a really long time. And in fact, he might even be able to hand it down to his kids and they might be able to hand it down to their kids as well and reminisce about the times they made memories with their dad. I would also probably want to share with him that if he invests in this more expensive fishing rod, he will reap the reward of not having to explain to his wife why he's buying a new fishing rod every year. So you can see kind of the difference in the language that you use when you get really, really specific about that psychographic. And I do want to really encourage you to take some time to think about what that persona looks like for your own business. You can make it as detailed as you possibly can, and you can make a list of as many different types of ideal clients that, that you frequently see. There's this weird concept in all writing, um, but it definitely applies to your content, and it sounds a little counterintuitive, but the more specific that you can be when you describe someone, the more universal that, that it actually is. And I'll give you an example of that, that you'll probably be able to um, integrate that a little bit. So if someone describes this apple, if someone says, I had an apple for lunch, your brain is like, oh, great, you had an apple. But if somebody tells you that it was this perfectly green Granny Smith apple, it was just a little bit more tart than they expected, I bet you can nearly taste that apple in your mouth and your cheeks probably puckered up a little bit or your mouth started watering when I described it. And it, it's the same with people and it's the same with our writing. The more clear you can be about the individuals that are buying from you before you even start to sell to them, the better off you are. Um, so one more thing in considering 
who they are is asking what other things they like and what other brands that they, they shop with and buy things from. And this will help in your overall messaging. It also helps you, um, someone asked a great question about like starting up marketing when you're starting up your business. And it also helps you know what other places those people are going to physically, which might make really good collaborative opportunities or really good marketing opportunities for you too. So for example, like a Whole Foods shopper might also be looking for bamboo clothing, eco-friendly makeup. Um, when someone is getting a new home, they're typically not just speaking with a real estate agent. They're also talking to a title company, insurance. Maybe they're looking to um, move their investments over. So they're talking to a financial advisor, things like that. So you want to really look at what other what other places is your ideal customer shopping? And those are also people that you can tie in with your networking, your collaborations, and your marketing. And then the other really important thing to consider is when you're looking at that psychographic, where are these people spending their time? Are they spending their time reading newspapers? Are they on social media? And, and if so, there's a, di there's a different breakdown depending on if it's LinkedIn or Facebook or Instagram. So where is your target market spending a lot of time? Are they Googling things like crazy? That will help you to know where to put your content and where to put your marketing dollars. So let's talk about your brand now that we've um, talked about beginning where the customer is. So I heard a really great analogy recently. Um, it was by Lab Creative, which is a branding company. And she described this tray full of plain vanilla cupcakes. So I want you to imagine that everyone in your industry is on this tray full of cupcakes. And they're all exactly the same. It's just a sea of cupcakes with nothing differentiating one from the other. So what is going to make your customer reach for your cupcake over another one of the of the vanilla cupcakes. Chances are they're just going to reach for whichever one is closest and whichever one is cheapest because there's nothing really that stands out to them. So the fact is there are a lot of people in your industry. Um, there's a lot of people that are doing the exact same thing that I'm doing and I don't want to just be a victim and I'm sure you don't either of people just choosing whichever cupcake is closest to them or whichever one is cheapest. And that is where our branding comes in. So now I want you to take that sea of cupcakes and imagine that every single one is decorated completely differently inside and out. So there are red velvet cupcakes with buttercream frosting. There's carrot cake cupcakes with cream cheese frosting and crunchy walnuts on top. There's chocolate with like the darkest chocolate frosting you can possibly imagine. You also get to decorate this cupcake any way that you like. And that's where the branding comes in. That is what is going to separate you from the sea of cupcakes. Not every person is going to be drawn to your brand. Not every person likes the same kind of cupcakes. Some people are allergic to walnuts. Some people really like red velvet cake. Some people are chocoholics. Um, but the point is, is that your brand starts to help people to identify with what makes you uniquely you and draws people to you. And the great part is, at the same time, it also kind of repels the people that aren't probably going to buy from you or aren't interested in what you offer. So by setting yourself apart with your branding, which I'm going to talk to you about bringing into your content, that can help to keep the customers away that you don't want and attract the customers that you do want. And when you're looking at your branding, it's really important to ask yourself what your brand personality is. Um, there's all kinds of personality words for us as people. And there's also all kinds of personality words that you can apply to your brand. There's a smart and informative brand. There's a sassy and bright brand. There's silly, playful, soft and soothing. No answer is wrong. Um, but it is really important to ensure that every piece of marketing kind of emulates that personality and keeps along with the tone of what your brand is. So you can feel free to put in the chat some of the ideas that you have about what might describe your brand personality. But again, that's something to take and, and sit down with and really think what words describe who we are as a brand. What, what do we want people to feel when they're looking at our company and interacting with our content? 
Um, for example, a couple of mine, I feel like I am very authentic and bright and professional and fun. And I like mixing professional and fun because I think that professional can be fun. So those are just some examples of brand personality. And that's how we set ourselves apart from this sea of other people in our industry. When you start to bring in your brand personality into your content, people will see a difference. I have heard it a hundred times over again. When people have their voice in their branding, their customers notice. So now we're going to start talking about the different um, the ways to basically create a content marketing strategy. So there's different buckets of content. Um, I, I like to call them buckets. Some people have a special acronym or a framework that they put them in, but for today's purposes, we're going to call them buckets because there's, there's a lot of um, information out there that you can find about the 80, 20 rule where it's 80% serving your audience, 20% selling. I believe if you pour from each one of these four buckets, you don't even need to worry about the 80, 20 rule because it's going to fill that naturally. So the four buckets are, um, I'll come back to them and, and touch on them individually. So Jeff, you can just leave the slide. Yeah, you can just leave it there. But the four buckets are educational, inspirational, promotional, and personal. So we're going to start by talking about educational. Um, educational content is the type of content that your ideal customers and clients are going to find really beneficial and informative. It may or may not be your original content, but I find most often it's better. The more original content you can create, the better. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples. Sharing a blog of yours or someone else's that is industry related, sharing a podcast episode or having your own podcast um, that is really interesting and helpful for people in your industry sharing something like a tip of the week or an answer to a frequently asked question. I'll give you this little, this little freebie here. Um, the questions that you all submitted at the beginning of this workshop or before this workshop are all great pieces of content that I can walk away with and, and use to create content. So the questions your customers are constantly asking are a fantastic source of content for you. Um, another great kind of example of educational content is something like how to use your products together. So for example, if you have spices and oils and local honey as like a health food store, you could post great recipes or share great recipes that kind of incorporate all of those elements. So you're not selling people, you're really educating them and you're, you're again, reaching that psychographic and that demographic with information that they're gonna find really useful and relevant. Um, so some examples of like headlines you've probably seen that contain educational content are three things you might need to know before buying your next car or four ways to mitigate the mold in your home or reviews on six healthy dog foods for your dog. So those are all examples of, okay, this is a clue that somebody is gonna go into something educational. And the idea is really to serve and provide your customers and clients with content that is relevant to their interests and also really helpful. So the second bucket is inspirational content. And this is where we are going to go back to that brand personality a little bit. Um, so each of us has an opportunity to do this. It's going to look really different depending on what kind of cupcake you have. But we all have examples or sorry, inspirational content that is going to kind of help our customers be the hero of the story. Like that's really our goal here is to show them they're the ones that are making these, this amazing decision to change their lives and they're the hero here. So a lot of this kind of content you'll see are really inspiring quotes that your ideal audience can relate to. Um, stories of success that other people have seen, um, things that are that are cheering them on and letting them know that they can do it. It's it's content that really shows that you understand the struggles and the stress and the pain points that they're feeling, and you are letting them know that there is hope on the other side. They can do it. They can get through this. Um, another really great way to use this is to use community content. So 
that's kind of your opportunity to collaborate with those other people in a similar industry as you and pull them in as cheerleaders too, because you really want to empower, you want to show that, you know, you're a champion of the same thing that your clients are a champion of. You might see these in the form of like Mindset Mondays or Thoughts Thursday. I think you really can have a lot of fun in this area because it allows you to loosen up and show a little bit of your brand personality and it doesn't need to be silly or funny quotes. It can be really serious stuff, um, but it's really just making your customer the hero. I love to use inspiring anecdotes or, and even when I'm going through something, I'll often share about the journey from, you know, getting to the the one side of the grass to the greener, the greener grass on the other side. Um, all right. So bucket number three is the stuff we love to share about. And we, this is where they, they talk about that 20%. Um, we love sharing our promotional stuff and the things that are promoting our business. Um, back to our, my analogy at the beginning, this is where now you get to really describe what's in that office. Okay. You get to say what color the walls are and talk about how lovely the shop is. And this is where you are going to, now you've guide, you've led your customer to you. And now you're going to tell them about all of the great things inside. So this is where you share your products and your services and what sales or events you have going on. And then the, the things that make you stand out as a competitor, like your price point and your location and your convenience. Um, I will say in this category, it's still really, really important. And like I said, if you take nothing away from this, I hope you take this away, but it's still really important to keep your customer in mind first. Nobody likes to feel sold to. It, it feels very icky and there's a way to do it where your customer knows that you're doing this, you're offering them this product as a solution to their problem. So instead of pummeling them with sales copy, before you go to offer something promotional, really make sure you're clear on who this person is, what do they value, and tell them the story of how it's gonna benefit them. You, again, wanna make them the hero of this story. So the last um, bucket is personal, and that's my dog, Clyde. <laughs> um, that's what I share a lot when it comes to personal because I'm a solopreneur. So this is going to look totally different depending on whether or not you're a solopreneur or you have a team or maybe you're a part of a huge, huge company. It's going to look really, really different for every person, but they're an industry, but there is a way to do it for all of us. So this is like really letting your hair down and having fun with your content. It, I would say that there don't really need to be that many rules about it. Um, this is where you can show what you love about your work or maybe what your why is, what the purpose is behind what you're doing. Pictures of your dog or cat, um, you know, if you're, if that's something that is part of your business brand. Um, behind the scenes, so how things are done, how things are made. People love seeing behind the scenes day in the life content, um, telling personal stories, or even some people like to, to bring it back to their origin story, which is kind of like the story of how a company got started or how they d decided to do this thing. Um, and then you can also, if you're part of a larger organization or a larger group, this is a great spot for the Friday outing that your team took together or a team member Tuesday or um, feature Friday featuring one of the members of your team or office staff. I would, I would recommend you keep this category professional still and you do not need to share it all. You know, there's a lot of people that, that bear their soul on, on social media and in their marketing content. And you can do that. You can choose to do that, but um, you don't need to do that to be relevant. You don't need that to stand out. So that's really where you want to make sure that you're staying in line with your company values and what is important to your customer, but you can also let that personality shine through a little bit in this way, in this way. So as just to recap those four and to kind of help you develop a strategy around them, it's educational, inspirational, promotional, and personal. What I do at the beginning of every month is I take a theme for the month and I give it, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll just use the month of May for my, um, a group that I run. And the theme is 
uh, possibility. And so we're actually, I know it sounds a little bit of a stretch, but we're actually going to be talking about money in the group and what the different options are around money. It's a, it's a woman's entrepreneurship group. So at the beginning of the month, I'll take a theme for my brand, whatever brand I'm working with. And then I will break down these content categories and say, okay, what in this category do I need to fill in this month? Where am I going to share in my personal aspect? Where am I going to, what am I going to share educationally? What am I going to share to inspire? What am I going to share? What products and services do I need to promote this month? So I kind of break it down like that. And then depending on how many times you share your content throughout a week, you can simply just rotate, boom, 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 every single category straight through. And that is like the easiest, most basic way to create your content strategy that also aligns with what your company is focusing on and what your brand is building at any given time. And I want to say there's definitely room you want to leave yourself a little room to pivot and as things come up and you know there's a lot that has changed and happened in our world in this past year and i think we've all seen how things can change very very quickly so it's important not to be rigid in what you're what you're providing people for content you need to have room to you know uh, hear and stay current to what your customers are feeling and needing in that time so as we wrap up, I want to remind you of one really crucial piece. And if you get this right, you will be further along than most businesses. And that is really to keep the focus on your customers. Because at the end of the day, people care about filling their wants and needs. And they're using your business to fill that want and need. They have pain points and you can help them with the solutions to those pain points. So on another um on another note, if you're using digital marketing tools like social media, it's also really important to remember that what you give is also what you get. And in, an engagement, a lot of people say, no one sees my content. No one sees my content. Engagement is a huge, huge part of it. So you just posting onto social media is not going to get you the eyeballs if you're not also engaging with your ideal customers on social media. And I'm not a social media expert, so to speak, but I will say that when you're going, if, if you want a quick tip, um, if you're going to post something onto social media, I would say you should give yourself about 15 minutes to kind of like interact with other people that you know need that product. And you don't, you're not trying to sell them. You're just interacting on other people's content because what you get, you typically, sorry, what you give, you typically tend to get. Um, they call it posting and ghosting if you just sort of post and then don't do anything. So the a key is interacting. And when people put questions or comments on your business or brand social media, respond to them right there. Don't say, you know, I'll send you a private message. Respond to them right there so that people can see the expertise that you have to offer. Um, I kind of think of it as if you, if you don't interact, it's like, having a friend on the phone and all they did was talk and talk and talk and talk and they never asked if you had any questions or let you chime in and give your two cents back and that's what it's like when we just put posts or information out there and we don't have any conversation with our customers so ask questions of them open-ended questions on your in your content are fantastic for starting conversations um, and you can do that with any of the buckets asking questions usually gets people like the brain loves to answer questions. So when you're asking your customers and, and clients questions, they want to pitch in and be a part of that conversation too. And then hear what they're saying and notice who is commenting and who's asking those questions and engage with their stuff too. So people will remember that they will remember you interacting with them almost more than any brilliant post that you can put out there. So I think it's always really important to give what you want to receive. Um, and that is that is basically the high level of everything. I really can't stress enough to begin all of your content with who the customer is, where they are, and then you can start guiding them to use your products and services. Oops, you're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much.
much, Emily. That was really great information. I loved all the examples, especially the cupcake analogy and Clyde, obviously. Um, now we'll move on to the Q&A portion of the session. As a reminder to everyone in the audience, please scan the QR code um, to enter any questions that you have. There's also the link in the Eventbrite page, and we will start to answer some of your questions. Um, we've had a few come in. One is, what is the best way to bring new customers through your door for a newly opened business? That's a great question. Um, so I think a lot of that comes down to beginning again with who that ideal customer is and what other avenues they're seeking out. So when I um, decided that I was going to, I, I'll tell you what my retail in business was. It was a mattress store. So I got really, really clear on who that ideal client was and where else they were going. They were reading wellness magazines. They were reading local farmer's market magazines. And I made sure that my content was in those places. The other really um, underutilized tool, I would say, is to collaborate with other local businesses to help bring people into the door. So events are a really great way to bring people into the door. And, you know, for example, in that marketing, in that, sorry, mattress store, I would host events. Like I would host open houses and Mother's Day pampering days and whatever fits with your brand, you can host events at your location, which just helps to bring more people into the door. So I think events, and um, collaborating with other fellow business owners is a really, really good tool for that. Thank you, Emily. Those are great ideas. Um, we have another one that came in. Could you please recommend the best content marketing calendar template that's free? Yeah, this is, I love this question. Um, I, I can, you can find a content marketing calendar on pretty much any any social media managers expert on the internet. I will say that there there are a lot that you can use and they're fantastic. I think that it's important to create one that fits for you. So to that end, no probably nobody else's is really going to be perfect for you or the best. Um, if you want to my recommendation is that you take these four categories and you really break down different air, uh, different topics in each one of the categories. And you then can create a social media calendar in, you know, an hour for your entire month. And you don't need somebody else's social media calendar. And you can add into those too holidays and um, things like that, that you might want to be sure to observe. But I think that you can create one on your own for free <laughs> um, and use these buckets. And it's and then it's just so much more impactful because it's your own content. But I, I don't have one specifically that I would recommend. Thank you, Emily. That's a good idea. Um, one other one, we've had a, had a few questions on specific industries and how to uh, fill out that content. So do you have any tips for healthcare industry social media posts? Um, so you can have a, okay. So I guess it depends again on your, a little bit on your brand personality. And I also would ask who, who you're targeting with your marketing. Are you targeting the people that are going to be using the emergency services? Are you targeting um, doctors and physicians that are going to recommend people to that office? So that's something you definitely want to look into. But I think with this industry, you can provide a lot of educational content. You can provide probably a lot of hope for people, you know, knowing that there's some place that they can go when they have a time of need. Um, I think highlighting stories of uh, that 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 are um, that you're able to share, obviously not ones that are that you can't share due to privacy purposes, but s sharing stories of triumphs in your in your office would be awesome. And I also think that highlighting like team members or doctors kind of showing the heroes that are part of that organization would be amazing. But also focusing on what makes you different. You know, why would somebody choose you over another place? Great. Those are just a couple of ideas to get you started. Yeah, but you can use 
like I said, those four buckets can be used for any industry. So you can probably, now that you've heard this, come up with a ton more for that industry. Um, those are just off the top of my head. Awesome. We actually got a comment in that says, great presentation, and thank you. So I wanted to share that with you. Oh, good. We've got some more questions. Um, another one, just specific um, kind of industry and um, I know you already kind of did a broader one, but looking to apply marketing concepts to the evangelization of people in religion. So would that be the same kind of tips? Yeah, I think you could, so you could use the same four and it would, it would really depend on what your religion is. I guess with that, I would really focus in on what people's pain points are and what the hope is that you're trying to bring people through. And I will say that your target market is going to be a lot broader because you're a lot of people turn to religion during times of need and also um, to fill something inside of them that they might feel is lacking. So you're, you're going to have a really, really broad target audience, but maybe create some of the some of the more popular reasons that people would turn to religion and use those as ways to kind of hone in on what you're sharing, if that makes sense. But remember, keep it about the person that you're sharing the message with. They want, what message do they want to hear? What, how do they want to be inspired? What do they need to know? What kinds of things do you need to educate them on? Great. Thank you. Um, here's another question that just came in. What is a great way to keep your brand universal to the largest target market? Okay. I need a second to think about this. Keep your brand universal to the largest target market. Do you know what they're trying to ask? Um, looks like, I'm looking at their industry. It looks like they're in film, music, art, stage. So um, maybe just how to keep it broad so they can appeal to a wider, wider audience. Yeah, so I'm not I'm not like a branding expert, um, but that would totally come down to your messaging and just making like you know you're you can have a lot of client avatars like a lot a lot. So I guess it would be about more inclusive messaging and just making sure that what you're choosing to share is is. Uh, relates to a lot of different people. So you might want to be less specific in some of the things that you're sharing rather than more specific. Um, I hope that answered the question. I, branding is not my my area of expertise, so I would probably leave that up to a branding ex expert. Seems like a tricky one. Um, let's move on to another question. How can we determine which type of content is the most effective? Example, blog articles, videos, social posts. Great question. So your audience is almost always going to tell you what they like and what they don't like by way of what lands with them, what um, converts. Um, so part of that is going to be having like the back end tracking things on your end through your through your social media pages, through your website. I find. Um, and I didn't mention this in the presentation, but you can take a piece of content and turn it into almost any other type of content. So I'll give you an example. Um, you can write a blog on the five types of the five healthiest types of dog food for your dog. And every single one of those five types can be a social media post in and of itself. Every single one of those five types can be an educational post. It could be a promotional post. It could be a personal post. My dog chooses this, you know. Uh, it could be a one of those. It probably wouldn't fall into the inspirational category. But um, you can recycle content into different formats, and it will kind of show you and guide you which one is landing more with people. So sometimes something will work really, really well as a blog post and then you try it as social media posts and it flops. And, and I will say like a lot of times if your social media posts are flopping continuously, you might want to look at the messaging and whether or not you're really speaking to people. Because I, I find that a lot of times if that happens, it's because I didn't ask myself why I'm doing this before I did it. I just, I'm like, oh, well, I have this thing that I have to say and, and today is Tuesday, so I'm going to put it out there. But I didn't take a minute and just say like, okay, what, what is the why behind me sharing this thing? So I hope that answers your question, but recycling content is a super valuable tool and shows you where people are most consuming your content. 
Thank you, Emily. That's a good tip to kind of stretch all the uh, content that you're creating. We have another uh, specific industry question. I think people are like liking your ideas on um, what they can do. Um, but do you have any tips for a nonprofit that targets parents of children ages two to four? Um, so for this, you are, well, so there's so much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this one actually is fun. So you're probably going to want to really tap into that collaboration with other with other businesses that are also serving the same target market. At the at the same time, there is so much educational information you can pull out of. Like so so I'm thinking of like moms that are really tired and stressed out during this pandemic because they're working at home and taking care of their kids at the same time. So what information are those moms wanting to read that's like educational or maybe just inspirational? Maybe it's like a funny mom meme, you know, that you found that you're like, oh, our target market can relate to this. So there's all sorts of areas when you start to really dig into who's who's using your product or service and what is what struggles are they having right now? And then you can fit those into each one of these. Um, but I think like teaming up with other people in this industry is really, really valuable. Like, so I, uh, do a lot of the content for a transportation company and we share all it's for parents with kids and we share all kinds of content on like healthy recipes that are easy to make on a weeknight and educational articles that are like having a clean and healthy home. So there's a lot in that category. It's basically whatever your target market is, is interested in. And then as far as like the promotional stuff, I would really highlight the good that you're that your nonprofit is doing and highlight those success stories when you have them. And um, however you want to highlight donor stories would be awesome, I think, in there. Thank you. So I know you mentioned cross promotion and we have a, a specific question around that. Um, if you have a customer base that is significantly larger than the other business owner that you want to collaborate with, would you still recommend uh, partnering with that business? This is so, this is a great question. Um, again, it's, it so depends. I'm the kind of person that would typically go out on that limb and say, well, I'm going to take a chance on this. However, I think that what I've learned in collaborations is you have to really make sure that the values of your two businesses line up and maybe there's something that that person can bring to the table that is apart from an audience size. So maybe they're, maybe you're going to give them the, the most of the tasks to do, or maybe they have to come up with the graphics or something like that. So there could be a financial exchange where one person is putting more money in than the other person. Um, but I would say, you know, really choose your collaborations wisely and make sure that somebody's values are lining up. And if you feel like it's a good fit, and you're not going to end up doing all of the work and bringing all of the audience to the table, then I don't see that there's anything wrong with it. You know, rising tides, they say, raise all ships. And I think that if you can help somebody else's business, that's going to only come back to you. I think that's a great idea. Thank you, Emily. Um, another question on measuring effectiveness. I know you talked about it a little bit, but what do you do to measure whether uh, your content was effective or not? Um, so this is, you, yeah, you're going to want to, okay, of course they're seeing results. So for example, if, if you are doing a podcast and you have a call to action at the end of the podcast and nobody, nobody took that call to action, let's say the call to action is a website and you can see that nobody has clicked the link that right there shows you that that didn't land or work. Um, so you can try reformatting it. Um, but you can look at your actual metrics in your social media. You can look at your um, analytics on your website. I'm not a social media expert and I don't get into like those in-depth details, but you know, even, even on your Instagram, you're able to go in and see how many people looked at your post and where those people came from. So you can see if they came from hashtags, you can see if they came, if they were just organic finds and you can do all of that same thing on your website. Um, when you're leading people from social media to another page, like to your website, just know that the impressions go down a little bit because 
Facebook and LinkedIn, they want you to stay on Facebook and LinkedIn. They don't want you going other places. So they give that content a little bit less eyeballs, basically. Um, so if you're not seeing that, there are little tricks and tips like around it, but that's something to pay attention to. Like, do I not get enough? Do I not get a lot of eyeballs when I put a link in, in something to direct them outside of the app? Just things to look at and think about. Again, I'm not like a analytics specialist, but you can look at your own analytics and really see like what, what people's behaviors and patterns are. Thank you, Emily. That's a good idea. Um, we have another specific kind of industry question there in the, photography or imagery industry and um it looks like they offer tours um and drone kind of images awesome. is there any specific content uh ideas that you would have for somebody in that industry so fun enough um i have two photographers that i work with and they're branding photographers so let me kind of pivot in my mind to like drone photography so i guess um, I mean, definitely showing off your work is amazing. Like you, people need to see what you're doing, but also I think they need to know why, like, you know, we know when we're, when we're selling our house, why a drone photographer would be valuable, but what are some other reasons that people might hire one? You know, what are some, wh like, that's a question I would ask as an FAQ. What, why would I hire a drone photographer if I'm not selling my house? Um, so that's something that you could share. There, maybe there's also tips and tricks that you see when you go to someone's house or the property and you're like, well, they should have done this before I got here and they forgot. So that's something else. Like maybe they should have gotten the lawn professionally done by a landscaping company. That's You can list out tips and tricks of things that you see going wrong before you even get there. So like things you need to do to prepare. Um, and you can also have a lot of fun with that with video. Video is a really, really powerful form of content and almost every single app is giving a lot of precedence to video. So I imagine that there's a lot you can do in there too with, with drone photography. I don't know if you do video, but um, it definitely gets you up there as far as more, more eyeballs on your stuff. Thanks. Oh, that was a cool one to think about. Um, I just want to, give people a chance, one more chance to scan the QR code if they want to get any more questions in. Um, but it seems like we are wrapping up here and thank you to everyone that already put in the question. There are some interesting ones. Um, <laughs> let's see. Um, <clears throat> so if someone asked, I think you did kind of cover this in your presentation, but what's a good starting point and strategy moving forward for producing marketing content. So I think some of that was in the presentation. Yeah, a little of, uh, I mean, a lot of it was, um, yeah. but I, th I think also, you know, I, I think having touch points on your stuff. So not just like, okay, I'm gonna put this in place and let it run, like really, take time and, and look at what your strategy is. So like, what is the bigger goal this month, let's say, or what is the bigger goal this week and giving yourself time with your content and with your strategy and not just like doing something because somebody else recommended it. Like you really want it to be aligned with your business and what your goals are in, in addition to reaching that customer. So I think the more often you can kind of like check in with it and make sure that you're, you're on track is really, really good. All right, thank you, Emily. So we are coming to the end of our session and I wanna thank you so much for joining us. You can see uh, Emily's contact information on the screen. Um, and thank you to everyone for joining us today and for asking questions. Please look out for an email. Uh, we'll have the recording session uh, following and it will also be available on staplesconnect.com slash small dash business, along with a lot of other great resources and offers for business owners. We appreciate everyone's time and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.